I'm a clinician, a university clinician in Pavia, was involved, directly involved in treating these patients. And uh, I think we can start with my first slide. Okay. Uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, in uh, on <coughs> February 20, 2020, uh, we uh, had the first patient with COVID-19 uh, diagnosed nearby Pavia in a small hospital in this region. And then in a few days, uh, the epidemic spread rapidly, first northeastern through the counties of Lodi, Cremona, Brescia, Bergamo, and then all over the region of Lombardy. And uh, I would like to say that um, apart from uh, one university hospital in southern Italy, all the other hospitals participating in this consortium are located in this uh, high spot area of Italy. Practically, we had two hospitals in Pavia, two hospitals in Milan, one in Bergamo, and one in Brescia. And as you can see from this slide showing the number of hospitalized patients, uh, we had a huge first wave of admitted patients peaking in April, uh, in April and then progressively decreasing in May, June, and July. Then we had a second less impressive wave starting in October and then a peak in, in November. And as you can see, the number of severe patients as assessed by the 4C phenotype were much, <clears throat> the, their number was much greater during the first wave than as compared to the second wave. Uh, this slide shows the frequency of, of hospitalization subdivided by sex and age. When patients were stratified by sex, a difference in age was evident because women were mainly in their 80s, while hospitalized men were in between 50 and 69 years of age. Interestingly enough, the greater percentage, the highest percentage of severe cases, sorry, of severe cases, 23%, was observed in these middle-aged men, probably because this demographic uh, the part of the population was first treated at home and then was hospitalized only when their <clears throat> respiratory function suddenly deteriorated. This slide shows the, uh, the some lab values. And as you can see, if we subdivide patients according to their severe or not severe phenotype, we can see that, for example, albumin was low in severe patients to begin with in the first weeks of hospitalization, while the opposite was true for creatinine which progressively deteriorated during the second part of hospitalization. C-reactive protein, as already <clears throat> explained by other speakers, was very high to begin with, extremely high in severe patients, then progressively decreased, but it was always higher in severe patients as compared to the non-severe ones. D-dimer, again, was higher in severe patients, although there were some spikes with no clear-cut reduction during the hospitalization period. And the next few slides pertain to the experience in the Maugeri hospitals. The Maugeri hospitals are a network of rehabilitation hospitals with no <clears throat> ER, which are located in many Italian regions, but, in, but regarding this uh, talk, I will, I will only uh, tell you the experience in the hospitals of Pavia, 
Bergamo and Brescia. During the pandemic, these hospitals were transformed into COVID-19 hospitals for patients not requiring intensive care unit. And you can see the crane. This was a picture taken from my office in the hospital that the crane moved almost all wards of the hospital and all, all, almost all equipment to rebuild completely the hospital. Often COVID-19 patients were admitted after being hospitalized in other hospitals or treated in the ER of other hospitals. As a matter of fact, we hospitalize um, uh, something more than 1,000 patients. The majority of them were hospitalized in Pavia. And um, as you can see, um, male patients prevailed 55% as opposed to 45% females. This mean age was 74 years, and the survival rate of these patients was 88.6%. This slide shows you a comparison between the first and the second wave of hospitalizations in the Maggiore hospitals. As you can see, the uh, male patients prevailed only during the first pandemic wave, while during the second one, there was no different, no sex difference in hospitalized patients. The mean age of hospitalized patients was greater, 76 years, and during the second wave as compared to 72 years during the first wave. The survival rate was not different during the first as compared to the second wave. But it is important to note that during the first wave, we had quite a lot of mortality in younger people, while during the second wave of the pandemic, the mortality peaked in patients 80 years old and or older. This slide shows you the prevalence of reported comorbidities in the majority hospitals. As you can see, there was quite a lot of prevalence of cardiovascular diseases independently from the age of patients at the, just at the beginning of the disease. This prevalence remained high during hospitalization and then tended to decrease at the end of the hospitalization or afterwards. During hospitalization, we also observed a peak of reported comorbidities in regarding the endocrine and metabolic system. This peak might be due to a, a decompensation of the glycemic control due to the um, administration of corticosteroids in these patients. Two minute Regarding warning, your... please. Two minute Sorry. warning. Two minute warning. Yes. Regarding neurological disorders, we had apparently a drop during hospitalization. I, we think that this drop was not real because at the end of the hospitalization, the number of comorbidities in the neurological area were almost the same than at the beginning. While we observed a, an increase in mental disorders, which did not remit at the end of hospitalization. We had some critical aspects of data collection which must be reported. The temporary stop of almost all routine clinical activities during the first pandemic wave probably resulted in a poor characterization of the post-acute phase of the disease. And also during the first pandemic wave, information about, about the first positive PCR, PCR swab was only retrieved by a retrospective analysis of patient notes. Overall, our participation to the consortium is a valuable experience because it allowed the rapid collection and sharing of clinical data and knowledge by pre-existing, using a pre-existing scientific network 
and by a careful choice of globally available data, easily retrievable from administrative data and EHRs. Consistent disease patterns across different countries, health services systems were <clears throat> obtained due to the development of this multinational severity stratification algorithm. And also we had dedicated work group groups providing deeper insights in different aspects of the disease. And finally, new data analytics strategies and shared across groups were developed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for that very nice uh, presentation and uh, inspiring presentation. Um, I'm going to ask at least one question before, after each presentation. And at the same time, I'm gonna look at the chat group just in case uh, there are um, other questions. Um, so my question is on the, first of all, are the rehab hospitals part of the same administrative structure as the uh, tertiary care hospital? And the reason I ask that, because the second question is, could you extract, uh, is the data extraction from the rehabilitation hospitals the same procedure as uh, getting it from the uh, tertiary care hospital or is it a different procedure? Well, the extraction was the same. The, the only difference, I mean, these rehabilitation hospitals were transformed in hospital for acute people. The only difference regard the absence of, the, of an intensive care unit in our, hospital, in our rehabilitated hospitals. Then, but the pattern of observed data and observed, I mean, uh, there was not quite a lot of difference in the two types of hospital, general hospital with um, uh, intensive care units and our hospital. Then uh, uh, probably the pattern of this patient is almost the same uh, because the, of course we also have patient transferred to intensive care units, but overall there was not, not a real difference in the, in the lab values, uh, in the in, uh, clinical features, uh, in uh, comorbidities between, uh, between the rehabilitated hospitals and the general hospitals. And now, as hopefully the disease is shifting, are you gonna be seeing more uh, long, so-called long COVID in the rehab hospitals? Or is it gonna be still evenly uh, distributed among hospitals? Uh, we. I mean, we, we are moving in our rehabilitation hospitals to post-COVID syndrome, and hopefully we will have data on post-COVID syndrome uh, because <clears throat> this is a new challenge, new clinical challenge. Uh, of course, I mean, some of these patients uh, that will treat it at home, they will not have access to the hospital. Um, then we must, uh, let's say, have a look to uh, people uh, treated at home and people treated in the hospital and trying uh, to dis dissect the different patterns of disease in the two types of patients, those who are more severe probably and those who are less severe. I would like to remind you that the Italian National Health Service System will treat uh, free or charge any type of post-COVID post -COVID syndrome, even in the hospital. Wow. All yeah. right. Thank you very much. That was, that's impressive. So yeah. thank you. Um, any other questions I mean, yeah, from the audience? Diane, uh, seeing none, will you uh, queue up the next uh, presenter? Yes, we're going thank to you very much. queue up. Um, Kiyang from uh, Singapore. Right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present um, our participation, uh, Singapore's part participation in the 4CE. Uh, I've um, really been honored to be part of this uh, uh, consortium, and we've certainly learned a lot in the past year and a half uh, being part of this consortium. 
So, um, you know, I think I shall start a little bit by talking about where, how we are in Singapore today. Um, I think we, we certainly have many parallels with uh, other countries in the world, uh, except that um, right now we are in so-called an endemic phase, like some of the um, highly vaccinated countries. Um, we'll talk a little, I'll talk a little bit about um, our participation and how we got into the original manuscript at uh, 1.1 and 1.2. Um, we'll talk about the AKI subgroup uh, in which uh, we have the most um, uh, amount of effort and participation in and the manuscript that we have been submitted and also what we've learned uh, in participating in 4CE. So where are we now in Singapore, right? So we are one of the more highly vaccinated countries. Um, I think we are currently about 87% vaccinated. Uh, uh, this is by all age groups, so that includes our 12 years olds as well. Uh, so we are studying the, the data and uh, for the five year old subgroup, I think that should uh, come in about in the next month or so. So I actually um, read with great interest uh, what is being found in the pediatric uh, subgroup. And hopefully that would uh, extend the coverage to the uh, children uh, that we are that are, might be vulnerable to spreading the disease rather than coming down with uh, com complications such as uh, MISC. So um, despite the high vaccination rates, uh, sometime in uh, August, we have went through a phase of uh, into the endemic phase. So where we allow the number of uh, cases to go up. So we are seeing for nearly a good part of the last um, I would say 18 months or so, we've pretty much had single digits or sometimes just uh, low double digit case numbers um, after the initial spike uh, in February and March last year, uh, up to about August this year when the vaccination rates uh, hit uh, above 80% uh, where the government went into an endemic phase. And this has triggered a very large uh, number of um, cases, we are talking about uh, for a small country like Singapore, we are about 5.8 million. We are having about 2,000 to 3,000 cases a day for the past uh, month and a half or so. But as you can see, as uh, from this charts here, you can see that um, that number is coming down. And I think we, we do believe that with the vaccination, it, it kind of, it, it kind of uh, like, um, flattens the curve for the ICU uh, stays. So we are currently looking at about um, 60 to 65 percent ICU occupancy around Singapore uh, in this pandemic phase. So we, um, sorry, this endemic phase. So we are looking towards in the next three weeks to a, a month to see that number come down and hopefully we'll then be able to um, relax some of uh, the, the um, the kind of restrictions that we have right now. So really um, our, our team in Singapore was mainly focused in the AKI subgroup. Um, and this was quite early in the study uh, in the pandemic when we decided that we would look at AKI. And one of the attractions of AKI is somewhat is simplicity, right? Um, we, we thought that you know if we looked at creatinine and we looked at outcomes, we shall be able to uh, track with great clarity what uh, happened to some of these patients with uh, AKI and also to elucidate some of the mechanisms and contributing factors. Um, however, as we did the um, study, we realized that there were quite a number of challenges, right? So the key couple of challenges was uh, correction of the um, uh, creatinine values for to represent um, GFR. So that would be a, that, that's been a really great challenge because we didn't have some of the other variables that allowed us to calculate that. And on top of that, we, we didn't have really clean data on um, renal replacement therapy. And that was one of the major criticisms when we submitted the manuscript for review um, uh, earlier this year. So um, nevertheless, uh, we, would, we were able to gather uh, 18 sites with a total number of about um, 77,000, 78,000 AKI patients. And we have been able to do a certain amount of uh, data analysis. So one of the key things that we did when um, initially when we plotted this data was that we needed to align 
the uh, to normalize the serum creatinine trends by uh, aligning the peaks. So that is clearly aligned with the patients with or without ATI. Um, we can align those peaks and therefore make comparisons between severe and non-severe disease uh, and patients with and without ATI, as you can see in this chart here. So clearly um, the patients who are um, severe with ATI and of course uh, non-severe with ATI had a higher um, uh, creatinine values. And this chart here on the right really tells us the story of um, this uh, group of patients where AKI, of course, results in worse outcomes, but it seems to be far worse than um, patients without uh, COVID-19. So however, at that, at that point of time, that was last year, we weren't able to compare that against patients um, without COVID because we didn't have the kind of control data that we will have in uh, the phase two. So we're looking forward to making those uh, comparisons. So in terms of time to renal recovery, um, which is defined by 125% um, uh, of the baseline. So recovery uh, to below 125% uh, of the baseline. So this KM curve shows the, the pool data from the, the various sites. And essentially we are seeing that the recovery for patients with uh, uh, severe COVID-19 was a little bit more prolonged than the ones without, um, with non-severe COVID-19 in patients with AKI. So this is um, also expressed in patients uh, uh, in death rates. So patients with AKI, uh, even if they were, uh, they were non-severe, see on the chart here, they, they had generally a, a worse survival than uh, if the patients with uh, uh, compared to all patients, so patients without ATI, right? So, so this is one of the, those are the key findings of the data that we've assembled for the AKI cohort. Um, currently, we are essentially working, looking at uh, the subgroup analysis. So when we're looking at um, time to renal recovery, we found four variables that were significant, uh, two unsurprisingly related to chronic kidney disease and of course, uh, KDGO3 AKI. And of course, severity of COVID-19, COVID as, as I mentioned earlier, was a predictor of a slower renal recovery. Uh, surprisingly, liver cirrhosis seemed to have um, uh, a significant impact on renal recovery. Now, there was some discussion around how uh, like hepatic renal syndrome could have contributed to this. Um, however, that wasn't quite clearly established uh, in the, the actual analysis of hepatic renal syndrome. Um, Again, non-surprisingly, and this is something that we find in most studies that uh, involve um, a large cohorts of patients, uh, things like hypertension and ischemic heart disease didn't seem to have an effect on the renal recovery. So um, I, I perhaps I can would stop here about uh, talk, talking about AKI because I think that is covered in many of the groups uh, group meetings that we do have. And just to summarize a bit about what we've learned um, in participating in the 4CE consortium. So firstly, I think uh, you know, being an international consortium allows us to um, work together to work on, um, to study large cohorts of patients. I think this is quite valuable, especially for uh, you know, a country like Singapore, where we have relatively smaller cohort. Uh, I think initially we had some challenges in gathering the data. Um, and we, we weren't quite sure what were the standards and those kind of evolved along the way, but we are quite happy that uh, in the current state where the standards of the data are, are quite set. Um, in terms of, uh, I think the, the greatest thing and the most, uh, the proudest thing we have is the quality of our data and its implications in uh, the research outcomes uh, in terms of um, uh, data quality and the claims that we can make with that uh, quality of data. Um, what is really impressive about this uh, um, consortium, unlike other studies that uh, we have been involved in, is the, the automation of uh, quality data quality checks, uh, the scripts and sites. So uh, uh, the scripts that were produced from the different sites. So I think this is quite unique and I'm uh, very grateful to, for, uh, to Griffith and others to uh, put together a really a high quality um, and automated data quality mechanism. And of course, we have, with better data, we have better outcomes. And that's uh, shown in the various papers that were published as well as some of the data that I shown earlier. So we get really clean, uh, uh, nice outcomes uh, that, are, that can lead to more uh, 
impactful conclusions. Now, in terms of our wish list, um, of course, we would like to uh, participate in the, 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 the phase two studies, uh, especially with the expanded uh, uh, list for data collection for each subgroup. Um, we'll be very interested to look at vaccination and sort of long COVID data. Uh, as I shown earlier in Singapore, we, we have pretty good vaccination data. Um, long COVID data is a little bit challenging to collect. Uh, I think the, the last, I think last Friday we had a discussion on this. Um, however, for the objective markers of long COVID, I think uh, we we probably will have quite uh, good data on that. Um, one of the characteristics of the NUHS site is that we use OMAP for our mapping. So in the phase two, we have um, we have mapped our used our OMAP mapping into the I two B two format. So that automatically implies that the data will be made available to I two uh, to the I two B two format. And of course, uh, lastly, uh, you know, we we want updated package releases so that um, you know the entire consortium has the same kind of um, QC as well as uh, standards when we when we run those scripts. Um, so to end, to end off with my acknowledgement, so uh, the team in the uh, Department of Biomedical Informatics in NHS, myself and uh, Amelia, uh, who's on the call, uh, Bjorn, Bryce, Anthony, Scott, Emmer, and Mr. Chidham, uh, we'd like to thank the 4C Consortium for including us and the various sites uh, in uh, BCH Bordeaux, ICSM, KUMT, NWU, and UPenn for participating in the um, AKI study. And just a quick uh, announcement that we are running a datathon uh, later this month from the um, 27th of November to the 3rd of December. Uh, and this is our website. So just a quick announcement. And to end off some um, postcards from Singapore. I hope you can visit us soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Key. That's a beautiful, uh, actually stunning picture to uh, end on and a note of hope. Um, there is in the uh, Q&A section a um, question, and I'll read it out mm -hmm. loud. <clears throat> Compelling results in the AKA, AKA, AKI analyses. Yet I am stuck, struck by the, you presenting Kaplan-Meier estimates of time to renal recovery alongside striking amounts of mortality among AKI exper uh, experiencing individuals. Have you also estimated effects within a competing risk framework that presumes death as an informative rather than independent censoring event? How might this impact your findings re regarding comorbidities? Uh, such as liver conditions. Thanks for yes. presenting these findings. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Anonymous. But okay, just uh, very quickly, um, the, you're right. So the death is um, it's a censoring event uh, in the KM curve. So um, this definitely will have impact in our findings for comorbidities, uh, such as of course liver conditions. So what we give, given that the cohort size is uh, quite uh, reasonable, I think. Though we, we, we never start intended to study this as a uh, as a primary outcome in terms of uh, liver sort of events, um, but I, the best we can say is that that's an association, probably not a causal causal effect. Um, and in terms of um, death events uh, across the sites, uh, they unfortunately we, we we didn't study them in in specific detail. What's the cause of death? Uh, that will have elucidated uh, perhaps. Um, not just COVID-19 as the cause of death, but the comorbids as the cause of uh, death would uh, elucidate those uh, causative events. Looks like um, Scott Wong has a question. Scott, I'm gonna allow you to talk. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, I don't have a question actually. Sorry, the uh, wrong hand. <laughs> okay. So Diane, Office. if there's no other question, there's no other questions. Uh, let's go on to our next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Lake Key. Okay. Great. Let's go on to uh, uh, France participation. Uh, Bertrade. You're on. Sorry, I was uh, mute. Uh, yes, thank you very much. So are you seeing my presentation? Yes. 
Yes. But we also see the next slide. Ah, okay, sorry. So no. Okay. So um, yeah. So Antoine Noraz, the doctor Antoine Noraz uh, was scheduled to uh, present the French partici uh, participation to the Forsy Consortium. Uh, unfortunately, he's sick today. So he just asked me to uh, do uh, his presentation. So my name is Bertrand Moal. I'm a resident at the University Hospital of Bordeaux. Uh, and so this presentation is uh, 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 centered on uh, our experience as a center participating on uh, the Forsy Consortium. Uh, so in France, there is two uh, healthcare uh, structure participating uh, at the Forsy Consortium. One uh, in Paris, so APHP, regrouping uh, 39 hospitals uh, and representing uh, 5.2 million outpatient visits every year. And the University of uh, Bordeaux uh, with three hospitals uh, representing 540,000 outpatient uh, visits every year. So the uh, foresee, uh, uh, so the two French sites participated to almost all uh, the study from the Forsy Consortium. And uh, we were lead on one uh, specific on acute respiratory distress syndrome after SARS-CoV-2 infection on young adult populations. And we believe that uh, this uh, study uh, is a very good example of the power of uh, the Forsy Consortium because in less than uh, six months from the ID to uh, the submitting uh, paper, we were able to perform uh, our analysis uh, uh, thanks to the Forsy Consortium, including uh, more than 240 hospitals in the US and uh, more than 40 hospitals in Europe. That is a, a kind of a, a magic uh, for us. And especially for me, uh, because I was leading uh, this project and I'm only a resident. So it gives you also an idea of the open, uh, um, uh, open mindset of uh, the Forsy Consortium. So independently of uh, your grade, of your background, if you uh, have an ID and you convince uh, uh, participant uh, from Forsy uh, that it's a good ID, uh, you have access to a very strong uh, tool, a very uh, uh, great uh, network, uh, which can bring uh, significant knowledge uh, to the medical uh, community. Um, we believe that, uh, as you know, uh, during uh, the pandemic, there has been a multiple, um, uh, uh, multiple efforts to uh, federate uh, analysis across hospital. And we believe that the strength of the Forsy Consortium was uh, it's a very pragmatic step-by-step -step approach. Uh, and especially at the beginning of the pandemic. It would have been uh, very easy uh, for us at the beginning to uh, uh, develop a very uh, difficult and complex uh, plan uh, for uh, data sharing. And uh, for sure, at the end, it would have been a failure. But uh, hopefully, the approach was step by step. The step was defined collectively. And so uh, the eye of the step was established uh, to uh, add uh, value, to give value, but also established to be sure that uh, most of the site will be able uh, to uh, climb them. And so thanks to uh, this uh, method, uh, we believe that uh, the Forsy Consortium was uh, able to gather a lot of sites. Another uh, uh, advantage of this step-by-step -step approach was to uh, uh, very quickly uh, uh, produce uh, significant results, which are very important uh, for uh, to maintain the motivation of the participants. And uh, also, we believe that uh, the step-by-step -step approach was very uh, um, uh, interesting because it gave us the opportunity as a consortium to have a fast iterate. Um, the odd and change this uh, pandemic. Uh, one uh, area of improvement could be uh, um, uh, could be uh, done, and I think Griffin uh, speak about it 
uh, at the beginning of the presentation is that uh, basically um, the 4C consortium is now uh, for the moment centered on the E2 B2 um, uh, technology and for site as a PHP, uh, which uh, are using OMOP, it's more uh, difficult to uh, uh, um, extract uh, the data uh, in the 4C uh, format. And so it will be a very uh, helpful and uh, give the opportunity to more sites maybe to be included in the 4C consortium if uh, we add um, a more detailed um, tool to help a site not using uh, I2B2 to participate to uh, this consortium. And um, at the question uh, why uh, we as center, we stay and we continue uh, collaborating uh, 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 when uh, the, there is uh, no fund for our participation. Um, we have like a, uh, an answer uh, with four elements. First, uh, we believe uh, and we think that um, through the 4C consortium, uh, the uh, expertise is very uh, is uh, of a very high level, different topics, informatics, uh, medical. And so it's uh, very enriching for us to participate in this analysis. The fact that uh, uh, there is like quick results was also an opportunity for us to um, uh, demonstrate to our direction uh, what was the interest for uh, our site to participate uh, to this uh, consortium. Um, it's difficult to, to, to understand how and why, but uh, we believe that uh, the uh, foresee participate and uh, uh, create a very uh, positive and enthusiastic scientific environment of research. And it's a real pleasure to work with all, all of them. Uh, they are always uh, uh, very happy to help each other. And so it's, I think, a, a major reason of why the, the 4C consortium is uh, successful. And uh, we all believe uh, in this long-term investment, uh, what we have done uh, for uh, the COVID could be done for other disease or public health uh, issue. And uh, we believe that it's a very uh, powerful uh, tool. So thank you uh, very much. And uh, you have uh, uh, all the uh, Paris and the Bordeaux team uh, in France here, and thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to participate in this consortium. Uh, thank you, Bertrand. Uh, you did uh, a great job. You can tell uh, Antoine that uh, you did an extremely good simulation of him, and uh, I just hope he's not sick with uh, COVID. Um, no. Good, good. That would be a bad, a bad irony. Um, so. A really uh, impressive work, and frankly, when you're talking about why um, you work with a volunteer organization for CE, um, I think it resonates, and I think it creates a bit of a problem for all of us because, um, on the one hand, I think we should be talking in the near future about how we can raise funding for all of us because it'd be nice to get funding. On the other hand, I think that the dynamics will change when, when people get paid. They'll say, am I being paid enough for my work? And uh, right now everybody's volunteer and so it's all goodwill. I do think we need to get to a point where we are helping people financial support with analysts and so on. Nonetheless, my prediction is it can be a little bit challenging to make that transition from a, volunt uh, a purely volunteer effort to getting uh, funded sites. Uh, but I do think that in the, in the near future, we'll be talking about grant, writing grants together to actually be able to find key helpers that we think will be helpful. I'll, I'll stop there. Any other questions? All right, in the absence of any questions, uh, thank you, Bertrand. And uh, sure. Diane, let's queue up the next one. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, Kavi, who will talk about the India participation.
Hi, uh, I hope you can see my slides. Yes. Okay, perfect. So I am presenting uh, the work here. A lot of people here involved and contributing to this. Uh, this effort represents, is kind of representing of the, representative of the rest of the world. We have 4CE right now, mainly concentrated in US and Europe. And uh, so this work in India is kind of in that direction about it. There are some challenges and also it's, it has a lot of, it has a different meaning. This work has a different meaning in the rest of the world in terms of the, the impact that it can have. Uh, the cap capability of uh, the capacity building, as as, as Bertrand mentioned in the last call, in the last uh, presentation. Okay, so when we started this out, uh, the use case was involving India into the 4C consortium. And the 4C consortium is uh, you know, multiple sites working together. They have the same way of harmonizing the data and run the same analysis and produce files which are analyzed together to produce uh, insights, uh, research insights. So when we began with this, this did not fly because of the regulation that uh, we have to get uh, we have to get approval from uh, the Indian government for for this to happen for any kind of any kind of research uh, to happen in India which has a foreign component needs approval from the health ministry. So while we are working on that, we did not wait. We took, we took up a second use case. <clears throat> we looked at what are the learnings, sorry. <clears throat> what are the learnings from here, which are gonna be helpful for the institutions which are willing to participate. And we started working on how we can help improve the research infrastructure there, which is a classical I2B2 use case. <clears throat> but a vision of this work is really to, to have to give a feedback uh, to the policy making and even hospital management uh, and and have uh, have an impact in in, in you know uh, have a practical impact up beyond research so these are the three use cases that we are tracking uh, okay this is the current state of the network in india uh, we began talking with 14 hospitals uh, in six of the hospitals, we had a, a triad of, you know, uh, having a clinical champion, having some IT staff and the hospital administration coming on board. So we moved with these hospitals and kind of formed a network. Uh, six of these sites have submitted IRB uh, and five of them have got IRB approval pending the health ministry approval. And five of the sites have begun installing I2B2 so that's where the uh, hands-on work is. <clears throat> now, what are the challenges and why is this different? So one is that there are human resource challenges. There are you know, cultural and economic barriers for clinicians pursuing research. Hospital IT typically has less investments. Uh, and uh, though around outside the hospital, you'll find great expertise, but not within the hospital. Uh, uh, the IRBs are not used to dealing with this data. So the data is there, you know, expertise is there, but this has not happened because it's all new to, to, to the setting. Uh, uh, hospital administrations have not worked with this kind of a uh, configuration or you know, collaboration across hospitals. And obviously we have the health ministry screening, which we need to get this approval before we can do any kind of research. And obviously there is great need for money for this work. Now the objective of the current pilot that we are doing is the following. Uh, is basically to find clinical and public uh, insights of clinical and public health importance. But we also want to show that the EHR data is there, that it is available. It can be automatically extracted uh, to produce meaningful analysis. It, it is of sufficient quality uh, validated with other resources like some chart review. Also that this method uh, methodology and the approach is effective, is in fact effective to find insights of importance it's cost effective and that it is feasible to do it in this area. So these are like the aims of, of our work over here. Essentially, it uh, this work of the consortium in India is on, on these assumptions. One is that 
automated ESR based approach is better than manual data collection in terms of cost and maybe an equivalent in terms of quality. A federated approach is better than a centralized approach. Essentially, big noisy data is equivalent or better than small accurate data. That's where the cost economics comes into play and why you know this work is a long-term investment. Here are some of the milestones that we have typically you know, for a site getting onboarded, you know, getting hardware, installing the software, load playing with mock data, creating, you know, getting familiar with the software. And I2B2 is, is, the, uh, is a uh, stepping stone over here. Then harmonizing it, working with real data, and then you know, uh, getting, creating the population summary output and generating insights. Uh, so Amazon first, uh, uh, the Amazon team really helped us, uh, you know, and we came up with this construct of uh, how to securely, you know, how to create a secure, secure enclave, you know, for, for this architecture and in, in this setting and how to uh, really make the security, address the security concerns, uh, you know, uh, so th that these are some templates that we have done in, in Amazon. The stack that we are using is a simplified I2B2 stack. Uh, so people, there's a very short learning curve and uh, the sites just start loading, preparing these Excel files and we bought tooling to load that into I2B2. So these are very simple, uh, uh, enable sites to onboard data very quickly. And so, and we, have auto, we are working on automating it using GitLab uh, internal GitLabs, you know, in, internal to the hospital to load that and automate the process. Okay. Uh, so in, in India, uh, third wave is anticipated. So uh, hopefully the work that we're doing will help address that. And that's what we're targeting. And the pro overall progress report has been is that, uh, in summary, is that we've created a, a large hospital consortium. These are large hospitals. Uh, so there are five to seven hospitals involved right now. We've submitted four grant proposals. Uh, five sites have got IRB approval, but we are waiting to get the health ministry approval. Health ministry approval proposal will be submitted in November. A lot of work has gone into that, uh, into in preparing that proposal and sending it now. We are at the stage in which we are preparing MOUs uh, with the I2B2 foundation, and we want to uh, have the MOU signed in, in this month. There are two manuscripts which are in preparation. One is a vision document about how this work in, impacts in India. And secondly, the feasibility study about uh, about the three use cases that how can, how, how, uh, how, how much of it, you know, uh, of it, of the uh, uh, obstacles can be addressed here. Yeah, so let me stop here and open it out for questions. Thank you, uh, Kavi. Um, I'm, I'm looking for questions. So Kavi, um, who actually did the I2B2 implementation on the AWS cloud? Yeah. So the AWS cloud, uh, this work was an architecture that if the hospitals decide to come on, on the cloud, then you know, AWS created this uh, enclave and we made this design and we made this cloud formation templates, but the hospitals have not been willing to come onto the cloud. So we created this uh, and, and prepared to once, so right now we want to, we're focusing on prem as Sean had said, you know, like. Hospitals are not willing to come onto the cloud because of trust, but eventually we expect that there will be some component, maybe not at the hospital level, but at the government level. So there are some other projects happening uh, apart from 4C. There are other projects where I2B2 is getting used in India, where this construct may be helpful. But hospitals, the mainstay is mainly on prem. But uh, also, I want to find out the. Uh, I want to mention the principles which have come out of this work are very generic and they're also informing the on-prem architecture like you know how to how to create how to have this layer around i2b2 so that it's resilient to lack of expertise in security yeah yep and at this point 
what, if any, expert, if you were to mention one place where you need more people working, which area would that be? Uh, so people working in India on this, right? So it is educating. It's still educating the local folks about how this can really benefit them. So up till now, the people who are involved in this, they're like, wow, you know, it is so, it's available for free. It means a lot to us, but they have a challenge to take it in their community. So we need to have workshops and educational things conducted in India so that we're able to uh, expand this and, and make them empower the people who are already part of this network. Got it. All right. Well, uh, it's an amazing project. Uh, and Kavi, you've really put a lot of effort to it. I, I hope it continues to grow because uh, I suspect there'll be a lot more need for it in uh, the coming months uh, for a variety of reasons. So Sean, I Sean had his hand raised as well. Ah, okay. Sorry. I just wanted to ask Kavi about when he thought 4CE could really get involved. It's such a multi-step process, you know, to get things implemented and approved and through many, many layers of, of, of um, political oversight. Uh, you know, when realistically, Kavi, do you think, you know, the 4CE consortium will have India, you know, as a, as a partner? Um, so I don't see uh, right now that, at, so it all depends on the health ministry approving it. And the way we are doing our work with that, even if the health ministry says no, we can't obviously, we, at least the India people can do their work on their own and write publications, right? That is how we have oriented ourselves to. Yeah. Great, yeah, so. So we will, we will, we will yeah. they will use the software, they will use everything from here, but they wouldn't be able to contribute their data sets. Got it. Hi, uh, Kavi, this is Keith from uh, Singapore. Just a quick question. Um, you know, when your ministry uh, approves um, this, um, this uh, proposal, what, what are the considerations do they have? Is it the cybersecurity one or is it a issue with privacy and data sharing? I think the main problem is uh, unclarity about regulation. No one knows, you know, the regulations are not clear and, uh, the, and, and people are busy. Those are the two challenges. So we don't exactly know what is the challenge because this work has happened previously. India participates in a lot of networks and a lot of international studies. Uh, but there is some sensitivity or around, there may be sensitivity around COVID data. We don't know. Uh, I think just that they're too busy right now. And uh, we are not hearing back. Uh, we, we don't exactly know to, to, to be, uh, because there's no, there's no reason to have, because everything, the data is, uh, it's only population analysis that is getting shared. There is no privacy concern here. Thank you. Kavi, I just had a, a comment. Um, I, I know it's going to take a while before the government will um, hopefully approve the, the use of this for research, but it seems to me that this tool is, is really a tool that could support general hospital op operations. And so starting this movement of getting this out, you know, in, in India, it just seems like the, the benefits are, are, are really, you know, uh, just outstanding. Right. I mean, if I have to summarize the impact, uh, you know, it's one is we always look at one is boosting research output, right? There is very little research output from that part of the world because of lack of infrastructure and culture. Augmenting, you know, this can help augment public uh, decision making in the, in the clinic by identifying patterns. It can help policy decision making and mainly capacity building. You know, 4CE offers this mentoring network, you know, unparalleled and on participation of these sites in this network provides that mentoring, which is the hardest to get. And the tooling, the tooling that is coming out can help not only research, but also operational infrastructure in the hospitals, as Diane pointed out. Thank you. All right. Barring no more questions, I want to thank Kavi again and Diane. Uh, it's our uh, 
next uh, and last speaker, I believe, of this slot. Yeah, Andre from uh, Germany, you're on. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Zach. So I share my screen a moment and I go to the presentation. Can you just confirm that you, you can hear me? Yes. I, I, we can see it. Perfect. Very good. So um, my name is Andrea Frunotto. I'm a physicist and I'm working at the Institute of Medical Biology and Statistics at the University of Freiburg in Breisgau in Germany. So Germany participates in the 4C project uh, with three cities in Germany that are namely Mannheim, Erlangen and Freiburg that is here in, in the southwest of Germany. And it, it, these uh, three cities are actually part of a, a German consortium that is called Miracum, that is Medical Informatics in Research and Care in University Medicines, uh, whose aim is to make the routine care data of German university hospitals available to research, like exactly like a, a case for the 4C project. So uh, uh, in, particularly, in particularly, there are these three cities I told you, but I will speak more about Freiburg since it's the main um, contributor to the 4C project. So just two words about the uh, of, uh, University Hospital of Unclinicum Freiburg. Uh, consider that we are dealing uh, with a population of around 230,000 inhabitants, and we could participate to uh, the consortium with around 1,000 COVID-19 patients. The data was taken care by the, our institute, that is the Institute of Medical Biometry and Statistics, or INBI, that is... Uh, what I would like to point out that, that is not only an institute that is providing support to the clinicians uh, at the local uh, uh, university clinic, clinics, but is also very oriented in method development. And we ha had to take care of this data in particular because uh, in Germany, there is a, a very peculiar German modified ICD-10 code system. And this would not, was not actually uh, very easy to, to map to the uh, 4CA standard. Uh, it required a uh, certain work. In particular, I can mention about the ventilation codes because in Germany, for instance, we don't have a code for ventilation time. So this had to be deduced from, uh, from the, our database. And it was a huge work done by Adeline Makuju and Patrick Kittman. Uh, should be acknowledged for that. So I mentioned that uh, our institute is a uh, very uh, method uh, uh, development oriented. In, in fact, uh, I, I had to admit, I, told, I, I took uh, over the project not, not long ago. I had to acknowledge the people that worked before me that uh, were uh, intensively uh, committed with the, uh, uh, the studies that were proposed by the consortium. In particular, I, I would like to point out the, the, the study about the definition and validation of severity codes that were done uh, was done by uh, Martin Böcker and it was our for, former boss here. So uh, among these studies, uh, the last, last period, I, or in, let's say I proposed myself uh, a new study that is like the study of co-occurrence of medical codes uh, and, and their interplay with demographics data or passion status like severity or, uh, or, or uh, death and so on. And these are very interesting studies in my, in my opinion that, and it was already spread among uh, different localities uh, and, and different members. Uh, and I'm very happy about this. Um, just, the only thing I can uh, say so far, I, I didn't show you the, uh, the data of Freiburg because they are re really small, but if you want, you can uh, investigate them later. So the only uh, thing I would suggest to the consortium is to, is to make an easier um, access to the aggregated data because I could not uh, 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 get it so, so far. Uh, and that's because I think, you know, even uh, smaller locations, small, comparatively small location like our uh, uh, would, could, uh, could 
profit a lot from uh, from the to having this data because our soft skills and our know-how in uh, data analysis is uh, is quite uh, huge. So we could do something. The problem is that we the few data we have here at patient level they don't allow us that. But uh, aggregating the data would be uh, this would be possible. And I think this could uh, help a lot of the whole consortium, and uh, would absolutely express my a great appreciation to for the whole consortium for many many different reasons. Uh, the first one in, in, for what it concerns me that I'm not a professional clinician, I'm a physicist, uh, and is to hear you know about papers that were. Uh, uh, discovered and, and uh, read by some uh, clinician or some expert in the in the consortium and that gives insight and ideas that are otherwise very difficult to grasp uh, otherwise uh, and then uh, as I said before I, I would like to uh, express my enthusiasm for for how people were immediately responding to my the proposal of this uh, co-occurrence project uh, and let me just uh, uh, summarize some uh, some uh, acknowledgement for for the people here at the INBI, but also for all the people in the consortium that were so uh, helpful and supportive in uh, my project and, and my problems. Uh, and th I would like also to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was that was great. Um, and thanks uh, to the kind work for the kind words. And I think you really have. Um, contributed materially, and it's great that we can create this multi, truly multidisciplinary uh, consortium. So I'm going to look. Are there any questions? All right, I have a question for you. Um, is the IT in infrastructure? basically EHR system, the same or very different in let's say Freiburg and Erlangen? No, no, this is the, the, the consortium inside Germany is yeah. strongly connected with, uh, uh, for, for instance, with, uh, we are creating uh, layers like fire, um, 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 layer in such a way that we can really share the data in a, in a nice way. Uh, this is really, really powerful consortium, this miracle. It's, uh, it's it, it, actually this is an important thing because, you know, we can already, we have already the, like the mindset of sharing the data in this, in this context. And there's also a lot of um, expertise in our lab about this. I see. So um, based on what uh, Daniela Söller uh, is, is writing, I'm concluding that on the one hand, the systems are diverse and individualistic, but there is a fire layer that you've implemented somewhere, which allows uh, uh, sharing of at least a subset of the uniform data. And it's, 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 quite, it's quite remarkable to me that the countries that have been the most effective in monitoring COVID internally are those who put in the most efforts up front. And so uh, France is a great example. Um, Germany is a, is a good example. England was a great example. That's why they were able to run their uh, randomized trial with real world data for that revealed uh, the most effective drug in COVID, namely dexamethasone, uh, by having this re reasonably um, rationalized, harmonized uh, system. But, in the United States, we were not quite ready at the same level. We did not have quite the same level of uh, harmonization, but we're, we're trying to get there. 